way. And what I'm talking about is uh, some, some ideas arising from a different project that IMI has been involved in over the last four years. It's it finished actually at the beginning of this year, called Themis, Theorising the Evolution of European Migration Systems. And um, this project was established to try and explore the idea of migration systems and particularly look at the feedback processes, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Which are, we see as the social mechanisms that link migration experiences across time and space. Um, so the mechanisms by which migration between localities in one period can affect subsequent migrations, giving rise to rather set stable systems, what we would call migration systems. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is, is a critique of the way that a lot of this work has focused on the social networks as driving this sort of feedback. Um, this has been an international project um, with Oxford, Erasmus University, Rotterdam, the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, and Jürgen's been very much involved in, in the project, and also the Institute of Geography and Spatial Planning in Portugal, with other collaborators in Brazil, Ukraine, and Morocco. And what we were doing, um, just to give you a very quick sense of it, we were looking at localities, in particular destinations, in the, the Nether Netherlands, Norway, Portugal and the UK, and looking at migrants moving from Brazil, Morocco and Ukraine. So the idea was to try and explore how the migration patterns shift, how the evolution of the migration patterns varied across those different origins, moving to those four destinations. So we looked at Brazilians moving to the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal and the UK, with semi-structured interviews and individual surveys um, in both the destination and origin. I can give you more details on, the, on all this should you want it. Um, so what do we mean by feedback? And there's you know, sometimes some confusion perhaps. Um, for our purposes, we're concerned with the mechanisms um, by which migration at one time induces changes in other elements of the system. And it can include a range of factors. We can be talking about immigration policies, economic cycles, migration cultures, a migration industry, um, individualist aspirations and capacities. And, and this is a very mechanistic work. It's a, it's a very clunky diagram, I guess. Um, but you can have the migration at one time has an effect on the labour market. And that, that micro effect may have an effect on the relationship between employees, employers, migrants, and the, it's a migration industry. And it could change individuals' aspirations and capacities. There's various ways this happens. I'm not going to try and uh, go into this at all. Just to put it, in our paper, we're particularly focusing on feedback at the micro level. So what happens, how, how what how migration at one time actually ends up affecting people's, we could maybe use the term aspirations to migrate, and affects their decision making. Um, the literature on mi migration feedback has, in particular on the individual level, has tended to, as I said, focus on social networks and the operation of social networks. And that has, as Heinz argued before, it's tended to obscure these more extended sort of feedback mechanisms. Again, I'm not going into that discussion today. Um, but going to actually try and pick apart the, some of the work on definition on social networks. And actually found a very helpful uh, an article by Paul DiMaggio and Phillies Garrett, who's here, looking at three types of uh, network effects that can take place in migration contexts. You know, they, talk, they talk of social learning effects and occur when networks provide pieces of information. They talk of normative influence effects, where social networks change the way that migration is valued, so affects the social pressure to migrate. And also talk of network externalities, the common resources available through previous migrant flows, and so resulting in creating a migration in industry. Um, but one of the problems I we found with a lot of this discussion, it's never very clear what a social network means. And what we want to suggest is maybe rather a strong definition. Is 
it's not just about shared origins. It's not good enough to just look, well, people, they all come from the same town. So that's the social network. For us, we understand it's, been, it's got to be a bit more meaningful and sustained connection between people. That can then be hypothesised to change outcomes. Because what we're trying to explore is how, these, how the, this feedback can actually end up in changed outcomes. So it's not just about knowing a migrant from the supermarket checkout. You know the person, you know, you come and see them every day when you go to... Some, but that's the only interaction you have. Or, or you meet people when you go and walk your dog in the park. Um, it's not even when maybe you have a lawyer and you're getting divorced. A very, a very important, critical interaction. But for us, it's really... It's when you get a much more multifaceted and diverse set of relationships <coughs> with some that maybe they have more of an influence on you. And this may be stronger than most people want to go. So it's when you're sort of, you know, you start moving into playing golf with your lawyer or you <laughs> go to the parties and um, then it becomes more, more of a social network in our, in our understanding. Um, now in our sample, we asked people about whether they knew someone in the in the destination before they went and for the most part they did so the exception was Ukrainians in Oslo um, but what we want to observe is just because you know someone who has migrated before you doesn't mean you actually communicate with them so how does that result in feedback just because you know someone who left um, but uh, this, the opposite is true just because you don't communicate with people does not mean you don't hear news or see images and get information. And our data shows there's no significant difference in the access to news or images. In, in, in 10 of our 12 corridors, we couldn't see any significant difference between the news and images that people get, reported getting, of those who knew people before they had migrated and those who didn't know anyone in the country of the destination country before they migrated. So it suggests maybe there's a bit more work to be done on um, understanding how the ideas and information about migration are transmitted. And this is what we're just trying to unpick a bit here. So what we want to suggest is what we, we refer to as broadcast feedback. And so on the one hand, we've got feedback, which is transmitted through social networks. And that we, we, I think you can differentiate perhaps between personal network feedback and narrow cast feedback. With the personal network feedback, that's the stuff you'd expect, that one-to-one -one correspondence. It used to be in the old days, people sent letters and they used telephones <coughs> and now it's Skype. But you know who's on the other end. So you are making a deliberate communication with people. Increasingly, you also get what we now we refer to in the paper as narrowcast feedback, where it's actually it's not quite so direct. You send out your newsletter. It used to be, you know, we have the round robins or Christmas letters that you can send round to tell people about the family news, and it just goes. Everyone gets the same. Now, of course, it comes through blogs and such like. Um, but it's too. It might be impersonal from the sender but they are targeting it to people they know. Um, and I'll come back to the uh, discussion on blogs. But that's directed to members of their network. But what we're focusing now on is this other form of feedback, which we're calling broadcast feedback, slightly different, which operates through more impersonal channels. And um, we distinguish here between... Um, Three different sorts of this. And this is, it's very much a heuristic device, the, the, and I'll, come at, I'll say at the end if I've got time about the, the blurry boundaries and things. We want to suggest the, these three different ways of which broadcast feedback operates. Um, and a key point is the transmitters and receivers, if you like, are not connected initially by any social network. Initially is quite an important word there, and I'll come back to it. And we distinguish these three sorts. So first, the obvious, general broadcast, as we've called it, where the information, images and ideas are scattered widely, th perhaps through the media, television, radio, newspapers, the internet. It's not targeted to a particular group. 
in given localities. It can hypothetically reach anybody anywhere. Um, and, uh, and it can take place in physical space or it can, it can be virtual. Um, and what, so an example we found here from our field work uh, was in Brazil. Uh, for Brazilians, many of them referred to this, and maybe some of you, have, this uh, soap opera. The idea of the Netherlands as a destination was promoted, people reported, by a storyline on this popular soap opera, Paginas da Vida, Pages of Life, broadcasted on the largest Brazilian television network, Global. And it featured these characters studying in the Netherlands. This is Leo, um, who, a student, lives in Amsterdam on a boat and one of its canals. Fantastic. <laughs> But here, the migration element, it's not really part of it. Isn't it? This isn't about migration. It's a storyline in a soap opera. But it's, it's broadcasting this notion about migration, which people reported picking up. The second sort we talk about in the paper, what we've referred to as embedded broadcast. And this is more the sort of images and ideas that are seen within a particular setting, make sense within that setting. A Dutch car is not very special. If you're in the Netherlands, it might not even be very special. If you're in the UK, yeah, it's a Dutch holiday maker. But when you're in Morocco and you see the Dutch cars driving around and you see who's driving them, it starts to give a message. You know nothing about the person. You just know this is a Dutch car and that's a Moroccan. And it starts to give, a, give an idea of, uh, of migration. So it's much more, this much more contextual. Um, the other example is one of Heinz's pictures from his field work of, of, of course, the migrant house. And I think we've already heard some, some stories of that already, so I won't go into that. Um, but again, I've, we've got our quotations. Um, but this is actually from Ukraine. Again, these stories, you don't need to know the people. You don't need to be connected to them. They don't even need to be from your town. But you see this stuff. And it, you interpret it in particular ways in these settings. So that's what we're calling embedded broadcast. The third type we have is what we call induced broadcast. And this is where the person who actually is receiving the message is a bit more active. They go to find out things about the migration. They don't necessarily know anyone in the country of origin, but especially with the internet, they can go and look at the website of Laos, the Bible for Brazilians in London, and they can get a load of information there. And there's many examples of these magazines. The reason I refer to it as induced broadcast is what then can happen is they start commenting, they start following, they start establishing relationships with the people through, as it's so easy to do now, through Facebook. And so they become part of the social network. But the critical point is, this has been induced by the feedback. It's not the social network is generating the feedback. So the, mi the potential migrant has gone out to look at that and get immersed into this. Um, so th there's many examples of this. And this, of course, can then facilitate, have this facilitating role in migration and help to, to reduce the costs, um, you know, give, give new information. And it operates through the internet, but also in less... Um, there's a picture taken from the field work in, in Kiev, um, where people can actually start, if they want to engage with migration, they can start making connections. And it can then lead to marriage, or for many people it can also lead to exploitation. But the, it, it's part of the feedback story, and it can, but it, and it can become part of social networks. Um, my time's about to go out. Um, so I want to talk very briefly about the interplay between this broadcast feedback and feedback operating through no so social networks. It's a fuzzy, they're fuzzy and permeable boundaries. The anonymous commentator becomes the Facebook friends. They can complement each other. Messages given through networks can be supported by broadcast feedback. So one migrant explains to his sister 
about um, how that he's unemployed and he can't find a job to pay his mortgage, but she sees a different story on the TV. And so how that information is weighed up um, differs. And it can also be, um, have the you know, they, they can complement each other, they can contradict each other. Um, but also we have this interesting quote about the way it can also feed through into my, so the effect of this broadcast feedback can maybe vary, has to vary over time and space. Um, you know, so it's migrant talking about how you actually receive, deal with information. Um, okay, so I really am out of time. So our claim is not that broadcast feedback is the big story necessarily, but it's an important part of the story. It can interact with and moderate the social network effects. But its origins lie outside the social networks. So that, that's the critical point. And it can have a marked influence on migration behaviour, what seems to be, be the case with the, from our research. So our, limit, our analysis is limited. We focus only on social networks. So we're arguing that we need to have a more, explore this broader context. So I'll leave you with a final thought, which maybe feed into the final session as well. <laughs> <laughs>